Well, um, I know most of your audience are uh, African diasporans, and I want to tell them that we love them all. We love every African diasporan, mm. and they are welcome. Ghana is their home. Africa is their home. They are welcome. They are always welcome to Ghana and Africa. You know, let's come together as one people and develop our African continent. Let's come together as one people to make Africa great again. DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are going to be chatting with Eric, who is from Ghana, and he's going to be sharing some really insightful information about the cultures of Ghana, particularly the Ewe people. And he's going to be sharing some insights that he has in terms of his perspective on the Repat movement and all the folks that are moving to Ghana. And so really looking Looking forward to this discussion. So first, Eric, I'd like to welcome you and just ask you, you to introduce yourself <laughs> to the audience and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Eric and I'm from Ghana. I live in the capital city of Accra and uh, I'm, 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 I'm a Votarian, okay? I'm a Votarian by tribe. And uh, I'm about to share the history about my tribe to your to the audience. Yes, basically that's what I have to say now. <laughs> <laughs> now, Eric, uh, when I put out the call for more information about Ghana, uh, you raised your hand, which was so awesome. What made you so passionate about sharing this information about your culture? Well, uh, I think when it comes to my culture, it's a very significant culture when it comes to Ghana. We are one of the unique people in Ghana and um, I just want the, the African diasporan to know about our history, to know about our culture. So I've, I've, I thought it wise that we are one of the unique people and it's just nice to share the culture with the people, African diasporan especially because they are African, they are African by descent, okay? So I thought it wise that sharing the, the culture with them so that they, they are also previewed to the Ewe culture. Anytime they come to Ghana, they know that there is a tribe called the Ewe people. Yes. Wow. Okay, well, let's jump right in. Uh, so can you share some of the history of the Ewe people? Okay, there are many different school of thoughts about the origin of the Ewe tribes. Okay, with a school of thought tracing the origin as far back as the earlier settlement of Ajatume, a suburb founded by Ham, the second son of Noah in the Bible. So it has a relation with the Bible, the biblical times, okay? The Ewe people, it has a correlation with the biblical time. Oral tradition claimed the Ewe people were led by an ancestor called Gu, under whose leadership they settled uh, they settled at the delta of the river Nile in present day Egypt. Other ethnic groups also settled in Egypt, in, then including the Jews forced by drought in their land of Canaan. There were cultural exchange among the various people with a group adopting practices of others with whom they live in close proximity. The act of circumcision of male children, and this this uh, this traditional rite is done by the Arab people too as well. They learned it from the Egypt, the Egyptians, and the Jews. Okay, the act of circumcision of male children, pouring of libation, pouring of libation, learned via the worship of the sun god. Okay, so in the ancient Egypt, Egyptian time, the ancient Egypt, they they normally pour libation. And the pouring of libation is like a pouring, pouring of snap 
onto the onto the floor on, onto the ground to the ancestors so they used to do that in the, uh, they used to do that at uh, the olden egyptian times okay so those those kind of uh, cultures were exchanged we learned those things from the egyptians and the jews so those are some of the, 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 the rights we, we, we still exhibit now. We still perfect those rights now. We learn those things from the olden Egyptian times. And um, oh, okay. um, uh, Sue, so let me just ask you about that. And so you mentioned that the people of the Ewe uh, actually learned a lot of the traditions and the rights from the ancient Egyptians or the Nubians. And yes. so one of the traditions is the pouring of libations. And so exactly. you're saying that the Ewe actually learned that from Egypt? Yes, the Ewes, uh, the Ewes actually came from Egypt. Okay, they were, they, 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 they were the descendant of Noah, okay, who came to Egypt. They were the descendants of Noah who came to Egypt. And so we are directly descendants of, of Noah. So we lived in Egypt too as well, like you said. Ah, wow, that's very interesting. And so what is life like for Ewe people in Ghana today? Like, what is it like for you as an Ewe man in Ghana? Well, I... I don't know if you would want me to finish with the history I'm about to give, then we'll come to what it is for me as an elder man living in Ghana. Yeah, I don't know if great. That... Okay, so I would like to continue the history. So we learned all this attribute from the Jews and the Egyptians. For example, like I mentioned, uh, the male circumcision, pouring of libation, uh, outdooring of newborn babies, widowhood rights, kinship, kingship burial and kings and chiefs with their personal effects. We normally bury kings and chiefs uh, with their personal effect. Anytime we, a king dies, we bury the king with all their personal belongings. Mm. We bury them with all their personal belongings. That's one attribute the Ewe still exhibit until today. Mm. So, so after, after the old Egyptian empire felt, okay, after the, uh, Moses, Moses took his people out of Egypt. Egypt started falling apart, and the Ewe people also left. The Ewe people left just as uh, when the most when Moses took his people out of Egypt. That was exactly the time the Ewe people also left Egypt. And when uh, so we left Egypt, uh, it became the living in Egypt became very difficult. Okay, living in Egypt became very difficult as at that time when the when Moses and his people left, it became very difficult for, for Elwes to as well. So it was necessary for the Elwes to also leave Egypt. So the Elwes left Egypt. So I, I have something I've written down here I want to read to your audience. When it became difficult living in Egypt, just as the Jews left under the leadership of Moses, the Elwes also left under the leader, under leader me, and migrated in southwest direction. That brought them into Sudan where they made settlements for a while close to present day Khartoum. They stayed there, the, the, the stay there was short due to drought, drought, famine and slave raid by Arab slave trade who preferred black slaves to their own kind. Due to the, their physical courage, due to their physical courage at the time, there were numerous school in and out, in and around Khartoum and some elders took advantage of this schools to become great scholars and merchant farmers. Yes, so they left Egypt and settled in Sudan. They left Egypt and settled in Sudan. They further went ahead to move from Sudan. They were just looking for a peaceful place to settle. They were looking for a, a place that was free of war, a place that was free of, um, a place they can call their home. Mm. So they kept on moving from places to places. Okay, just to look for a peaceful place they could call their home. So they moved, they moved and finally settled at the, they settled, the people, the people were unable to rebel the superior weapons of the Arabs and Indians. So the Arabs and the Indians constantly kept on invading their lands. Okay, mm. the Elwes and the, and the Arabs and the Indians kept on invading their land. 
So they finally decided to, uh, so they, they, they couldn't just stay there. They kept on moving by these people kept on harassing them and all, and all that. So they moved on and settled in Nigeria, Dahomey, Togo. And when they settled in Dahomey, there was this king called King Agopoli. He was a very fearful king. He ruled them with a very thorough, he ruled them under a very thorough regime, okay? He ruled them with a very fierce hand. So they, like, I mean, the Ewe, the Ewe struggle has always been about finding place to call their home. They kept on moving from places to places just to find a place they could call their home. Mm. So finally, finally, they settled in uh, three different countries currently. They settled in Benin, they mm. settled in Togo, and they settled in Ghana. So the Ewe people could be found in these three different countries. Okay. We are about 6 million people, and you could find them in Benin, you can find them in Togo and in Ghana. Okay. So that's how came the Ewes came down and settled in Ghana. Got it. Wow, that's very interesting. Uh, and especially to hear about how they've been looking for their own land and a place to settle. So it really sounds like the Ewe have had quite a journey uh, as a group of people. Um, so yes, I would love to hear what it's like for you as an Ewe man in current day Ghana. Well, um, it's, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be part of this tribe, okay? I'm, I'm so privileged to be part of this tribe because this is one of the tribe that, that have been able to, we have been able to hold in high esteem our culture. There has been a lot of co foreign culture dominance among us lately, mm -hmm. but the Ewe tribe has been able to hold on to their culture. We've been able to hold our culture firm. When it comes to Ghana, we are one of the people who still celebrate certain rituals. We celebrate certain rituals that has been deemed since the emergence of Christianity and Islam and all those things has been deemed as evil. When it comes to Ghana, we are one of the, one of the true tribes that have been able to hold on to this culture. Wow. So yes, it's, it's quite overwhelming being part of this tribe and it's, it's a great feeling for me. Wow, you said something really interesting there and you said there has been a lot of foreign influence. And this is exactly. something that is particularly uh, poignant to me because a lot of, for example, folks in the diaspora are going back to places like Ghana in order to get that African culture per se, right? But they're actually getting a very foreign influ influenced culture. And so can you speak to maybe one of the rituals that you mentioned where it's looked at as evil now, but the airway still practice? Okay, so um, we practice, um, there, there is this ritual that we practice. I'm a Christian, so I, I normally do not pay attention to what, what goes on there, but we practice this traditional rite that we normally call our ancestors, okay? We call on, on our ancestors. In case of uh, any, any situation, when someone dies right now and the, the death of that person is, is unknown, when someone dies and we don't, they don't know the cause of the death. There is this, there is this right that they can perform in my culture that can investigate, that can look into what, what, what the cause of the death is. They can, they can invoke the death. They can invoke the spirit of the dead and question the dead. What killed this person? What killed the dead? And it's so right and accurate most often. So that's one of the the things we practice now. Yes, so basically, yes, that's it, that's it. Wow, so in the airway culture and tradition, if someone passes away, there is actually a specific rite and ritual where, how does it go? You can ask the person who passed away, how does it go? Can you come again with your question? So I was asking you to elaborate, so you said, this is the tradition where if someone passes away, you can find out how they passed away? Exactly, exactly. There is a ritual that, is being, that can be performed when someone passes on, there is a ritual that can be performed, especially when 
the person, someone is, someone was murdered, okay? When someone was murdered and the person, like maybe police investigation has been conducted and all that, and so the death, the, like the person who died, the, the death or the cause of the death is still not known. They can consult this, this, this they can conduct this ritual mm. to know what exactly killed the person. Mm. Yes. Wow. And you said it's usually very accurate. It's mostly accurate. It's mostly accurate because they, they evoke the spirit of the death. They evoke the spirit of the dead and the dead will confess that the dead will speak from his or her own mouth what killed him or her. Mm. So it's mostly accurate. Yeah. Wow, that is powerful. Now, I would love to move us forward uh, because we spoke a little bit about the various cultures of the Ghana and we've spoken about like Northern Ghana, Southern Ghana. So can you speak more to like the ethnic composition or how tribes work in Ghana for those of us who are just beginning to learn? Wow, that's, that's a nice question. So when you come to Ghana, when we come to Ghana, we have three main ethnic, um, we have three main tribes, okay? We have the Akan tribe, we have the, 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 the Ewe tribe, and we have the, the Nordness. We call them the, the Hausa tribes, mm. okay? So what, yes. So we have the three main tribe and we live in peace and harmony. I, I, I haven't been to any country that lives in peace and harmony with other tribes like Ghana. When it comes to Ghana, mm -hmm. tribalism and all those things, is not a much of a big thing when it comes to Ghana. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, probably because our first president, the, before Ghana gained independence, our first Ghanaian president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. he instituted a plan and this plan was perfectly executed. He instituted a plan that when you are from the northern part of Ghana, you come to, you attend high school in the southern part of Ghana. You can choose to attend high school in any part of Ghana you want. So you get to learn whilst in school, you, you mingle with your friends or colleagues who are from different tribes and it has great peace and harmony among the various tribes in Ghana. So when it comes to Ghana, the tribe, there's no, there's no too, there's no too much tribalism when Oh, I lost you for a minute. Eric? Yes, can you hear me? Should oh, I go I can... back again? Yes, I, I lost you for a minute. Like I just wasn't, you were um, not coming through clearly. Can you repeat the last part of what you said? So I'm saying that our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, say after Ghana gained independence, there are a lot of uh, senior high school, there are lots of high schools across the country. Mm -hmm. So he instituted initially, when you are from the Northern part of Ghana, you only schooled in the Northern part of Ghana. Mm -hmm. And it makes you very mediocre and, and inferior, and mediocre and, and, and ignorant to other cultures. So what he, he did was to let people move across the country to study, to attend schools. So you get to learn from your colleagues from other tribes and all that. So when it comes to, for instance, I have friends who are from different tribes. Because of my experience schooling in different regions, it has, it has enriched my experience. So I know much more about different tribes when it comes to Ghana. Yeah. So there is no, one thing I want to say is that when it comes to Ghana, tribalism is not a much of a big thing. Like the way when you go to other African countries, tribalism has created a lot of civil wars and all that. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Ghana, it's not much of a big thing like that. Oh, wow. That's great. So it's like, it sounds like there's a cultural exchange where if you're from the that's north, true. you go to school in the south. And if you're from the yeah. south, I suppose you would go to school in the north. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, very interesting. Well, speaking of the north, uh, there was a situation earlier uh, in the year that happened in northern Ghana in Tamale uh, with a very popular YouTuber uh, where she fell out with her former partner. Now, I had a lot of Ghanaian folks that came to my comment sections and they kept telling me over and over again, they said, DJ, this girl 
she's dealing with a guy from the north like they are known to be very very tough with women i would never go to the north i would never deal with someone from the north can you speak to that because this was very surprising to me of course as an african american i don't really know the difference so why do you think people have that perception of northerners well, that's their own opinion. That's, that, that opinion is, is solely reserved to them. I don't know on what premises they are saying that, but with, for me, the encounters I've had with people from the Northern part of Ghana has been extremely awesome. I've had some good friends from the North. I've had some nice people from the North. I've even gone, gone out in, as in dating with a Northerner before. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of preview to them. I know them very well. And I'm telling you for a fact that what they are saying is not preview to all nordness. It's just some session of people or it's just, individ it's just individuals. Okay, what they are saying is individual. It's not something that is solely peculiar to people from the north. It's just an individualistic something. But I can say that when it comes to the nordness, the Northerners are just like the Voltarians. They are one of the few people that have been able to preserve their cultures, okay? Mm -hmm. They've been able to preserve their cultures. Their cultures, their cultures, uh, it hasn't been influenced by foreign, foreign dominance, okay? So their cultures has been preserved kindly and neatly. So like, I'm, I'm sure those are one of their cultures. Like maybe as a woman, you, you have to make sure you served your husband with utmost respect and all those things. Like maybe if that's what they see to be, uh, they see to be uh, uh, possessive, if like the woman being submissive to their husband is what people from other regions or other tribes see that to be possessive, then I can't, I don't have anything to say to that because all my experience I've had with Nordness, it has been extremely awesome. Wow, very interesting. So in the north, there hasn't been as much foreign influence. As, no, not at all. They, they've been able to preserve their cultures. Wow, very interesting. And we spoke a little bit about the Ashanti as well. Um, can you speak to some of the relationships uh, that the Ashanti have with tribes like the Ewe people? What are the relations like? Well, the Ashantis, the Ashantis and the Elwes, okay. I don't know when it started though. I don't know when it started, mm -hmm. but the Ashantis and the Elwes, like we, I don't know. We, we sometimes, we just don't relate. Though we respect each other, but the, we just don't relate with each other that well. Mm -hmm. But the respect is there. We respect each other. Like I said previously, there is nothing like tribalism or maybe someone, a person who belongs to other tribe thinks he's more superior than the other person in the other tribe. There is nothing like that in Ghana currently. But I don't know. I think there is, there is, there is this growing rivalry between the Ashantis and the Elwes. And I don't know when it started. I don't know when it started. But I, the Ashantis are very nice people and they are lovely too. Mm. So when you say that the Ashanti and the Ewe don't relate, can you elaborate specifically? What do you mean? <laughs> well, 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 well. You're like smiling. I've been hearing... <laughs> You're smiling. <laughs> <laughs> like, I... <laughs> like I've been hearing, okay. I've been hearing that when I've been hearing from some of my friends that they they got, they got some Ashanti women that they wanted to go out with. Mm -hmm. But some of their parents declined because for the fact that the guy or the lady is an Ewe, their mm -hmm. parents declined the, 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 the relationship that, that was going on between the both parties. Mm -hmm. So I've heard that. I've heard that too as well. And some Ewe's too, I've heard that they don't really want to be, they don't really want to be married to Ashantis and all I don't know. I think one thing I one re, one thing I am sure of or uncertain of that could cause that is that mm. the Elwes were the last tribe, uh, the last region to join Ghana after mm. Ghana gained independence. The Elwes were the last people to join Ghana. Okay, mm. we were we were sovereign states. Ghana was a sovereign state. Like I said, Ghana and the other Elwes Elwe tribes. The, there is Togo. There is Benin. And the, the, the part of Ghana, the Ewe part of Ghana. So these people were sovereign states, okay? 
So after the, the, uh, the former president, the first president of Ghana, after the Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, after he gained independence for Ghana, he, he, I mean, he, he, he requested that the Votarians would join Ghana or join the other Ewel tribes, which is Togo. But we, we voted and we decided to join Ghana. Mm. So we are the last tribes that joined Ghana. So the, the Ashantis too, they've been the, the dominant since time in memorial. They've been the dominant since time in memorial. So since we were the last tribe who joined the Ghana, and we are very powerful too. I'm sure that's the reason why, because these are two powerful uh, ethnic groups. Okay, these are two powerful ethnic groups, and no one is just going to be there for you to walk over them like that. Yeah. So I'm sure that's also one of the reasons why. But I don't know. Uh, this is just this is just my point of view. I don't know for a fact that that could be the reason. But I think that I mean I mean we frown upon tribalism when it comes to Ghana. We frown upon tribalism. So on the radio, on TV, if you make any ethnocentric comment, you make any ethnocentric comment that could jeopardize our, our, our peace and harmony that we have in Ghana. You know, Ghana, our peace is one, one of the enviable things across the globe. You know, yeah. we are very peaceful and, 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 lo and kind, loving people. So I'm sure that's one of the reasons too. I don't know. I don't know for a fact what could cause that, but there's this, rivalry that goes on but it's not open people don't openly say it. it's mm. just it's just low key people don't openly say it. yeah you know i've noticed that too like just when i've spoken with people from various countries like there's a lot of things that can be said behind closed doors but publicly people won't say it so you might know that things are happening but people will kind of like oh I don't know if that's really happening but if you talk to them privately they're like oh yeah that's definitely going on yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's true that's true wow but, but, Ghana, but, Ghana, but Ghana when you come to Ghana like you know we don't we 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 don't we frown upon those attitudes like I mean talking bad about other tribes, me trying to make other tribes look bad in the eyes of other people. We really frown upon that. So I was surprised you said some some people reach out to you saying that people from the north are like this and like that. Because I've known some northerners who are very nice people. Okay. So I think it's it's based on their personal experience based on what they have experienced and all that yeah mm, absolutely wow well that's been very insightful uh and we're coming up to the last part of the interview so i wanted to take some time to discuss your thoughts on all of the uh black americans that are coming there are folks from jamaica the uk and so on and so forth um so are these repats being seen as absorbed into the larger Ghanaian culture? Are they seen as having their own ethnic group? Can you share a little bit more insight about the folks that uh, are coming to stay and where they will fit into the Ghanaian culture at this point? So when you come to Ghana, there are, like I said, there are various tribes in Ghana. There are various ethnic groups in Ghana. So the, like when it I, I think when it comes to Ghana, we don't we don't really see repats as 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 foreigners. Okay, we mm -hmm. see them as one of us. So it is up to you, the repat, to look for the tribe that fits well to you to join. Okay, so you can choose any tribe that you think you deem it right. You, maybe you listen to their cultural history. You think it's right and appropriate for you. Then you join. We don't see them as, as a different ethnic group, or we don't see them as a different tribe. With regards to us, we see them as, we see them like one of us. Oh, Eric, you're breaking Hello, up again. Can you, yeah, can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you can now. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear okay, you now. Sure. I lost you for a second. <laughs> okay, that's fine. 
So like I said, the repat, we see them like one of us. We don't see them like um, they are they are some, they are, we see them like just one of us. So we don't see them like a different tribe. So it's up, it's up to the repat or the person, the individual to look for the tribe that he thinks uh, fits well for him to join. Mm. So, I mean, for when it comes to Ghana, if you are black, you are black. We don't see you like maybe there's there's a, a different kind of breed or something. When if you are black, you are black in Ghana. Mm. So it's up to you to look for the tribe that you want to join to join. Wow, interesting. So, as a black American, for example, if you know I were to come to Ghana, I can just choose a tribe. I can just say, "Hey, I want to be a part of Ewe," and then I'm a part of Ewe. It's absolutely <laughs> true. You can just you can just decide to join the Ewe tribe, and you are good to go. And I'm, yeah, I'm that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. But you have to know their their history. You have to know their you have to know one thing we, we value so much in Ghana is our history, you know, our culture. Mm-hmm. So when you come to Ghana, if you join the culture, you have to learn the culture. You have to learn how they behave, how you have to, I mean, just learn the culture, learn to, you, you, you know, you just have to learn the culture and just be part of them. That's it. Okay, awesome. Well, that has been so insightful. Uh, That brings us to the end of the interview. Uh, Do you have any last thoughts that you would like to share with the audience before I let you go? Well, um, I know most of your audience are uh, African diasporans and I want to tell them that we love them all. We love every African diasporan Mm. and they are welcome. Ghana is their home. Africa is their home. They are welcome. They are always welcome to Ghana and Africa. You know, let's come together as one people and develop our African continent. Let's come together as one people to make Africa great again. Africa has been great before. Let's come together and just make that happen again. Because, I mean, when you go through the media, you look at social media, the kind of molestation and kind of, I mean, troubles Africans diasporas are going through is so painful. Like sometimes when I read, I see, I watch videos and all that with regards to the things African diasporans are going through. It's, 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 it's heart disturbing. It disturbs me a lot. So I would appreciate it if all African diasporans, I mean, we come together and make African great again. And I love them all. Aww. <laughs> So, so nice. Okay, well, thank you so much, Eric. I am so glad that we had a chance to chat. uh, And I look forward to hearing more about the Ewe culture in the future. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye Bye-bye.